I was thinking this week, has there ever been a time that you just poured your heart out before God? Has there been a moment in your life where you just felt powerless and hopeless to ever be able to change things on your own to where your only hope is that God would intervene? There's been a couple of times, a number of times in my life where, where I just feel like my only hope, my only opportunity was to just pray for God to do something. I was remembering this week, there's one time years and years ago, Noah, my second son, was still in utero, right? And we had an ultrasound and uh, the result came back abnormal and Noah had a hole in his brain. Um, I know a lot of people think he still has a hole in his head, but <laughs> back then, man, when, when I heard that, I mean, and, and so we're, we're uh, sent to a specialist. That was the longest two weeks of my life. Yes, yes. And all I knew to do at that point was pray. And man, I prayed with such dedication and fervor. The church we're serving with uh, prayed. And I remember being nervous going to the specialist and they got that, the high-tech ultrasound, which is probably low-tech ultrasound today, but back in Noah's day, right, that was high-tech. <laughs> the hole was gone. There was no evidence of ever being a hole and I just remember being both thankful to the Lord but shocked that God intervened. Has that ever happened to you? You pour out your heart to the Lord, begging and asking for him to intervene in your life, and then you're shocked and surprised when he does. There's another time, years later, I had just become the lead pastor of the church here. Uh, I was currently working with a woman who was leaving a lifetime of witchcraft, and she had chosen a life for Christ and was leaving all of that uh, darkness behind her and and I just remember, I don't know any other way to describe it other than a vision from God. I, I was asleep and everything was normal and I just felt like bugs were just crawling all over me. And, uh, and I sat up. And when I sat up, what I saw was a figure I knew to be Jesus holding two of my children. And then a figure I just knew to be a demon holding one. And none of the children had faces, but I remember crying out to God, uh, to Jesus, Jesus, save my boy. And Jesus said, I will, I will, trust me. I said, okay, okay, I trust you, now go get my kid. <laughs> and I woke up. And man, I'm not so spiritual that I wake up in the middle of the night praying all the time, but that night I prayed. Absolutely. I just repeated over and over as long as I could, Jesus saved my boys. I remember coming back to the elder board that uh, I think it was like the next day. Like what? like, what was that? And for us, we just determined that that was a warning from the Lord saying, listen, Brian, that you're, I, I'm secure in who I am in Christ. Right? No one can touch me unless God allows it because I'm aligned with God. But my boys were fair game. And we took it as a warning. Hey, Brian, you might be secure, but your boys are open targets. And man, that set me on a life of prayer and commitment to my boys. From that point on, I've tried to make it a more and more point in my life to invest myself in, my li in their lives. And now as all four of my boys are growing, not only am I grateful and thankful for what God has done in them and through them, but I got to be honest, I'm a bit surprised. Because that seems to be what we do, right? We pour our hearts out to the Lord in moments where we're hopeless and powerless, but yet we're surprised when God responds. Oh. Sorry, Tom. That's why it's been sounding weird. Good job, Tom. You guys never even knew that was down there, did you? I share that because I think... Uh, that's how 1 Samuel begins. 1 Samuel begins with a story of a woman who is hopeless and powerless. And instead of lashing out, instead of pouting in the midst of her despair, she poured her heart out 
to the Lord. Let me remind you of that prayer. 1 Samuel 11, listen to the prayer of Hannah. She said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come upon his head. And the Bible tells us where we finished last week is after she had that moment with the Lord where she remembered she wasn't worthless, that she was someone before the Lord. It says that her countenance changed. She was no longer sad. Something changed in her heart. But we were left with the question last week, would God intervene? I mean, Hannah was living in a time where the favor of God was removed because of her culture's sin, because of the brokenness of her people. I mean, we're left with this question, would God intervene in the lives of broken people? Would God intervene in the lives of broken culture? What would God do? And that's where we're going to get in today. If you're not already there, you can join me in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is in the Old Testament. If you need help finding it, one of the things I do is I just open my Bible. It usually opens up around Psalms, Proverbs. Then you just flip to the left and look super spiritual. You're just flipping pages. It sounds really cool. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Here's where we pick up the story. Right after she prayed, something shifted in her heart. Verse 19. Then they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Then the man Elkanah went up with all of his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go, for she said to her husband, I will not go until the child is weaned, then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Verse 24, Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. And they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord to Eli, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I pray, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. We have this great conclusion to God's response. Hannah pours her heart, out, her heart out to the Lord. God responds. All of a sudden, she's pregnant. And we, then we begin to wonder, well, will then she be faithful? She weans her son, most experts say, around two to three years of age, and she brings him before the Lord. God intervenes. Hannah gets her child. God gets his instrument. God gets his next leader and everything seems to be going great. After that, I guess my question is, how would you respond? Man, if you were Hannah, if that happened to you, if God intervened in a powerless and hopeless aspect of your life, how would you respond? Would you go to Penina, the other wife who was so brutal to you, and just rub it in her face? Would you respond in surprise? Would you celebrate your newfound fortune and forget all about God? You want to know how Hannah responded? Hannah prayed again. The second prayer. The book of Samuel begins with two powerful prayers. One prayer of hopelessness and despair. And one prayer of celebration. But it's not a prayer of what God did for her. It's a prayer of who God is for all of us. 
Chapter 2 begins with the prayer of Hannah, a prayer that, is, that would grow to be so influential and powerful it will be source material for great prayers happening later in life, later in Scripture, but it will also grow to be a rallying cry of God's people for generations to follow. Hannah prayed. After she poured her heart out to the Lord and God responded, she didn't celebrate. She prayed about who God is. Look how it begins. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like your God. The first part of this prayer, it's a prayer of praise. First thing that she does is just praise God for who he is. She said, My heart exalts in the Lord. A term exult, it means to jump for joy, rejoice out loud, to respond in triumph. And listen, she said, my heart exalts the Lord because my horn is exalted in the Lord. And there's so much there. Let me describe that. The horn, it's a term used to describe someone's strength, someone's position, a symbol of someone's value. The term exalted means to be raised up, to be held up high, to be put in a position, to be displayed with pride. He says, you want to know why I'm celebrating? It's not because God gave me a child. It's because in the midst of all my brokenness, God raised me up and placed me in a position of honor. He put me in a spot on the shelf as if he was proud of who I am. And look at this. She said, my heart is exalted in the Lord, by the Lord, through the Lord, by the power of Yahweh, because of God's activity. Man, God reached down into the, into the basement of my life and he picked me up and put me in a position of honor and privilege and pride. God did that. And it's like, I didn't do any of it. She said, you want to know why I'm celebrating, why I'm praising God? He picked me up out of a position that I deserved and exalted me, put me high up in a position of pride. So my mouth speaks boldly against my enemies. She said, because I rejoice in your salvation. Man, I have confidence in this life. Because God, you saved me. You rescued me. You picked me out of my position of despair and you placed me in a position of honor. Man, this is something that God not just does for Hannah. This is something that God is known to do for his people. Look at how Psalm says it. Psalms 89 says, For you, for you are the glory of their strength and by your favor, God. Our horn is exalted. God, you exalt all of us, all of your people. That's what you do. You lift us up out of our hopelessness and despair and you place us in a different position of honor. A few verses later, God responds about who he is. He says, my faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him and in my name, his horn will be exalted. God says, that's right, that's what I do. I lift people up. And even though you have dug yourself a hole, even though that you are living in a hopeless situation because of your failure, because of someone else's wickedness, God says, this is who I am. I exalt people. I lift them up. I rescue them. I save them from the pit of their despair and place them in a position of honor. Look at what she continues in verse 2. He says, man, there is no one holy like the Lord. She repeats it differently. He says, indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. That phrase, no one, means there's no one else in existence, no place where another like God exists. Man, Hannah begins her praise and is like, you know what? This is why I'm committed to you. I was hopeless. I was broken. I was powerless. 
I was misunderstood. My husband didn't get me. The man of the church didn't get me. The other lady didn't get me. I was all alone. I was powerless to fix it. So what did I do? I went to the Lord. And remember, this is a time where God promised, if you are not faithful to me, you're going to live in misery and pain. I will remove my favor from you. And I was like, I get it, but I, God, I'm still coming and asking that you would intervene in my life, and God did. As Hannah looks back on her life, as she looks backwards at what happened, the first thing she says is, man, God, I praise you. This is who you are. You've been doing this throughout time. First thing she does is offer a prayer of praise. But then she moves on to a prayer of power. Look at verse 3. It says, Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. He says, second thing I want to praise God, I want to pray about, I want to celebrate is God's power. First aspect of power, she said, he's a God of knowledge. She says that God not only knows everything, but he makes his decisions and acts based on that incredible knowledge. She's like, the first thing I love about God, God knows everything. And because he knows everything, he acts based on that knowledge. And with him, actions are weighed. Put your thumb in 1 Samuel for a minute, if you don't mind. We're going to flip to the other side of the Bible, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. I want to share with you the way the Apostle Paul says it. The way the Apostle Paul agrees with Hannah about the knowledge of God. Romans chapter 11. Starting in verse 33, I'll give you a second. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. I want you, like I said, sometimes I have you turn places because I want you to remember where they are in your Bible so you can go back to them. Israel eleven thirty three. 33, listen to how Paul describes God. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Remember, wisdom, knowledge is stuff he knows. Wisdom is, is his ability to act on it, to apply it in life. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who, can, who became his counselor? Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Oh, man. Man, Hannah looks back and is like, you know what? I praise God. Not first, just because of who he is and what he does. Man, he saves his people. He goes down to the depths of their life, to the hopelessness of their position, plucks them out and places them in an exalted position in his power, by his choosing. But second, she says, I praise him because of his power. Man, he knows everything. And based on that knowledge, he acts. There's no mistakes with God. There are no questions with God. Hannah says, as I look back, I'm reminded. Man, who can question God's actions? He knows everything and acts on it as a result. And then I love how she goes into a couple verses where she uses a lot of big biblical buts. That's maybe why I love this prayer. Verse four, she says, the bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. So the bows of the mighty are shattered. Man, God is so powerful that those people on earth who think they're everything, that think they're all that, their power is shattered, shattered, meaning that God's power will not only crush them, but he will put fear of God in their lives where they will never be the same as a result. Shattered doesn't just mean they're defeated. It means they're defeated with such power that they're worried about a future confrontation with God. But, big biblical but, the feeble gird on strength. As God with one hand is fighting the powerful, 
On the other hand, he's strengthening his people. She continues, those who are full hire themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry cease to hunger. Man, is everyone else who seems to have everything, they're just worried and always working? God is providing for his people. Look at this, even the barren give birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. That term languish, They wither, they waste away at the burden and pressure of the role of being a mom. Man, she might have a lot of kids, but with God absent of her life, man, it just buries her. And it's like, but motherhood with God in your life, man, what a role. I love this passage because it, it, it puts God as having this multitasking role to where at the same time, at the exact same time, he's not only fighting the powers of this world, but he's strengthening the hearts of his people. I had a conversation with my son recently who uh, told me that psychologists don't believe that someone can truly multitask. Multitasking meaning you can focus on more than one thing at a time, right? We can... Walk and chew gum, many of us. But if you want to have a conversation with one person and at the same time have a conversation with another person, it's impossible. Not with God. I mean, God is able to not only deal with the powerful of the world with one hand, but at the exact same time meet the needs of his people at the same time. Man, that is what Hannah says. This is what blows my mind, God. Your power, not only do you reach down and in your mercy and in your desire and love for me, you pick me up out of my despair and place me in a position of honor, but God, at the same time as you're, count, as you're handling the problems of this world, you are strengthening the countenance and the heart of your people. She continues, verse six, look at this. Look at how she describes what he has power over. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. He has power over life and death. Verse seven, the Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low, he also exalts. And God has power over wealth and economy. Verse eight, he raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles. God is in charge of who's in charge. God is in charge of world authority. And then it says, and inherit a seat of honor for the pillars of the earth of the Lord's. And he set the world on them. God's in charge of nature. She looks at his powers like, God, not only are you multitasking where you can take on the problems of the world, at the same time you can elevate me and lift me up, but God, you're over everything, life and death. Economies and wealth, world authority and power, all of nature, she said, God, your power is all encompassing. And I was thinking in my office, hmm, you know what? There's someone else who had those same attributes. Jesus had those same powers, right? Jesus had power over life and death, didn't he? Before he raised Lazarus from the dead, remember what he said? Look at this. He said, Jesus said, there are the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Shortly after he makes that statement, he says, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus comes out of the tomb. And Jesus had power over life and death. How about over economy? How about over finances? It reminded me of something Jesus taught his disciples. He said this, do not store up your treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Instead, store up yourselves treasure in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's even Jesus when he was forced to pay a temple tax. Remember what he did? Pulled a coin out of a fish. How about world power? The authority of this world. Look at what Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Man, everything falls under me. 
Everything's been given to me. Authority in heaven, authority on earth. It's all been given to me. I'm the guy. Even nature. Reminded of this in the Gospel of Mark. There arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on a cushion. And they, his disciples, woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Jesus, we're going to die. You don't even care. He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? You still have no faith? They became very much afraid, said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Man, for people to say that Jesus isn't God, Hannah says, God, here's what I love about you, your power. You have power over life and death. You have power over wealth and economy. You have power over all world authorities. You even have power over nature and Jesus demonstrated that same thing. And it's like, I'm praising you, God. I don't know why it is when I get in these moments of despair, I just worry. When I get hopeless, I just panic. Man, I don't know why I do that, God, because I know who you are. You, you're faithful to your people. You lift us up. Man, there is no one like you. There's no one with your power. You have authority over everything. And it says, I don't know why I panic. When I have God on my side. Same thing Jesus asked his disciples, right? I'm right here in the boat with you. What are you afraid of? Last thing. This prayer of Hannah. It's a prayer of praise. A prayer of power. And a prayer of providence. want to define providence for you. So I'm going to quote my uh, favorite theologian. You know who he is, right? Wayne Grudem. There you go. Gold star, whoever said that. And Joanne, was that you? Wayne Grudem. Here's providence. See, providence is not a biblical term. Providence is a term that we use to describe the activity of God that we see evidence in Scripture of. Does that make sense? Providence, God is continually involved with all created things in such a way that he, one, keeps them existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them. Two, cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do. Three, directs them to fulfill his purposes. May you want evidence of providence of God? Tyler mentioned the eclipse. Man, that's not nature going out of whack. That is an example of God's providence where he created the sun, he created the moon. He maintains their properties and what, what they do, but he still actively directs their movements. Man, God is providentially at work, not just in nature, but in your life. He has set things up to happen, but he also hand works with them each and every day ensures that everything that he wants to happen will happen just as he desires it to be Hannah after God works powerfully in her life she makes this prayer God I'm looking back on my life and I'm praising you for who you are you're someone who intervenes and you save your people we know that God there's no one like you you are powerful you are over everything But God, even though you're over everything, you're intricately involved in our day-to-day lives. Look at how she says it, verse 9. So first, he keeps the feet of his godly ones. God, you're actively involved in keeping. That term keeping means that God watches, God preserves, God puts a hedge of protection around the paths of his people. I mean, God, you keep watch over me. Every day you're watching where I go. Every day you're protecting me. That's why Paul says if you're going to boast in anything, you boast in the Lord, right? Because anything that you're doing is God empowering you and enabling you to do it. 
and every dumb thing that you don't do, my advice is to recognize that God probably protected you from doing something stupid that would wreck, it, that would wreck your life and your family. Man, I look back on my life, I feel like God has protected me more and more from the dumb things in my life than empowered me for good things in my life. She said, God, you keep, you watch, you protect the feet of your godly ones. You make sure that we don't get into too much trouble, but, big biblical but right there, but the wicked ones are silenced. God, you not only keep and protect me, but you silence them, you cut them off, you make them speechless. The term silence also used to describe something that is destroyed, put aside, or waiting for destruction. End of verse 9, she says, For not by might shall a man prevail. God, you are in charge and you are doing your thing, and there's nothing people can do about it. Doesn't matter who's the president, doesn't matter who sits atop the United Nations, it doesn't matter who your pastor is, who your boss is, who the governor is. Man, man's power doesn't matter what your position on earth is. Nothing's going to thwart God's plan. So why are we panicking, Hannah says. For not by might shall a man prevail. A term prevail. Nothing they can do will prevail against God. We'll be able to thwart his plans. Nothing man does can prevail against God. And that's the same statement that Jesus said about his church. You remember that? Jesus says, I also say to you that you are Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. Same word, but in the Greek, prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Man, if the church is about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is nothing this world can do about it. You recognize that. The places in the world where there is the most intense persecution, there's also the greatest growth in the church. You know that. Man, there is no, there's nothing that man can do. Man, if God is for us, who can be against us? That theme is throughout Scripture, and Hannah's like, so why are we panicking? I'm looking around, and my culture's broken, Hannah says. My life was in despair. So I went to the Lord, and I poured my heart out to him, said, God, look at me, see me. If you see me, I know you're going to act. And when you do, God, I will praise your name, and I will serve you. And God acted. And she looks back and says, I don't know why I panicked. I don't know why I doubt. I don't know why I questioned. God, this is who you are. You do this all the time. You pick people up out of their despair and you put them in a position of honor. God, the hardships in our life, this isn't beyond you. You're all powerful. There's no one like you. You have power and authority over all things. Nothing that anyone can do on this earth thwarts your plan. God, you are active. You're providentially involved. You are intricately involved in day-to-day activities. Look at verse 10. Those who contend with the Lord, those who battle with the Lord, those who complain against the Lord, those who put themselves in opposition to God, they will be shattered. Again, that term shattered, utterly destroyed, pulverized, broken beyond repair. Look how it ends. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Let me take a moment on that. See, there's a lot of discussion and debate and smarter people than me about this passage. What is Hannah talking about? A king. A king means a ruler on earth. But then that term anointed, that's the first time the Hebrew word for Messiah is ever mentioned in Scripture. First time the Hebrew word of Messiah is ever found in the Old Testament right here in Hannah's prayer. So the question is, well, what's she talking about? 
Some people say there is this grassroots movement amongst the people where they thought that they needed a king and that God was going to move providentially through this king on earth and intervene in their lives and save them from their brokenness. Other people say, no, 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 Brian, Hannah was praying. This was a prophetic talk about the Messiah, about Jesus. That Jesus is going to come and he's going to right all the wrongs. He's going to finally set God's plan into motion. And they fight back and forth about what Hannah was meaning. And because we fight back and forth, we miss the point. Or Hannah is saying, God is going to intervene in the brokenness of culture. Hannah prays like, God, we're in the midst of brokenness. Remember, everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. That's how Judges ends. They're in the pit of darkness as a people. There's disunity, there's pain, there's suffering. Hannah is just one example of the suffering that people are going through in their lives. But Hannah's example, she goes before the Lord and God intervenes and Hannah says, why did I panic? Why was I sad? Why was, why was I so grumpy through life? God, I know this about you. You rescue your people. This is what you do. Even though we deserve the pain we're in, God, you deliver, you rescue, you save. This is who you are. God, you're all powerful. Nothing can stand in your way. And God, we know that you're providentially involved in our lives. Where not only are you involved in each and every day, God, we can have hope in the future because we know everything you do is going to come to pass. Last thing Hannah says, God, I praise you because even when I look out and I see nothing but darkness, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, King David would say, I fear no evil because I know you're here intervening in me. I don't think it's by mistake that Samuel begins with two powerful prayers from a lady who had no rights, no privilege, no power, no opportunity, but yet she's the one that God providentially uses to begin a movement of intervention. My question for you is, where do you need to pour your heart out to the Lord? Where do you feel hopeless? Broken? Powerless? Fearful? Maybe it's in your marriage. Brian, he's never going to change. That may be true, but if he is ever going to change, I know who can change him right? God, I'm worried about my kids. I mean, the pressures of this world are engaging their lives and their hearts, and I feel like I'm losing them. I don't have any power. I feel like culture is pulling more and more of my power away and giving my kids more and more over to them. God, I'm worried. I'm panicking. I know who has all power and all authority. Man, you guys know this about my grandma. I think one of the most powerful things she did in my life was just pray for me every day. And I know she did because she left them on my voicemail. It was irritating, <laughs> annoying, and embarrassing when my roommates kept saying, your grandma called again. <laughs> but you know, and I have to look back. Man, I see God's protection because of my grandma's prayers. I see fruit in my soul because of my grandma's prayers. Are you hopeless, panicked about your children, grandchildren? Pray. Pour out your heart before the Lord. And some of you are looking down at the future. Brian, it's an election year. Things are going to go crazy. I know. But why are we worried? God has all power in the palm of his hands. 
He is providentially involved and there is no one like him and the power of the world will not prevail against him. You worried about the future? Pray. Where do you need to pour your heart out before the Lord today? First Samuel begins in one of the darkest times in Israel's history. But it doesn't begin with a condemnation. It doesn't, doesn't begin with a promise. It begins with a prayer. So I want to give you an opportunity today this morning. Pour out your heart before the Lord. You can do what you want. You want to kneel down where you're sitting. You want to come up here and kneel. I, I don't care. This is between you and the Lord. Hannah could have done a myriad of things in her life, but when she was desperate, she poured her heart out to the Lord. My encouragement to you is that you would do the same today. Take a moment. Pour out your heart to the Lord, and Tyler, the team, will lead us out in just a minute.